Hello, I'm Daniel Franklin, Executive and uh, Diplomatic Editor at The Economist, and welcome to this discussion on unlocking digital values, a path to recovery and beyond. Um, many thanks to Huawei for generously supporting this Insight Hour. Um, just a few housekeeping points to begin with before I introduce our panelists. Um, it's best to use Google Chrome to view this webinar. You'll find full biographies of our panelists to the right of your screen. And you'll also find a box with a selection of further readings on this topic. Please do uh, download that to, to enrich uh, uh, the background information you have. And you'll also find a Q&A box should you have any questions for our panelists. Um, now, to our panelists, I'm delighted that we're joined by uh, Tavi Roivas, former Prime Minister of Estonia, Jacqueline de Rojas, President of Tech UK, uh, and Andrew Williamson, Vice President and Economics Advisor at Huawei Technologies. I, I should just say that uh, Dambisa Moyo, who was meant to be with us today, had a last minute in emergency and sadly isn't unable, isn't able to uh, attend and sends her apologies. So our topic is uh, unlocking digital values, a path to recovery and beyond. Uh, we've had a very intense experience from the pandemic, from the lockdowns, from the disruption to our normal uh, working lives. So we're, I hope that we're going to draw lessons from that experience. Uh, what are the big challenges and problems uh, that, and also the opportunities that have been revealed by this. There's clearly been a great acceleration of a shift to dependence on digital technologies. I think we will also explore the role of governments, the role of uh, the private sector, uh, and what what uh, where each of these uh, actors has key uh, policies to, to introduce and key adjustments to make. Uh, and I think we're also going to want to look about at how you unlock or unleash uh, value while also avoiding unlocking inequality and perhaps even instability. So that's the sort of framework um, for the next hour. And perhaps we could start with you, Tavi, uh, in, in your experience in Estonia. Um, it would be helpful, I think, to... Uh, describe a little bit um, what Estonia has done in really setting a, a, a digital infrastructure for government, which has been really pioneering, and you as Prime Minister and beyond uh, have been very uh, in, involved in that. So uh, tell me, clearly a small country, you can. it's perhaps a little bit easier than it might be in a much bigger country, but you have really uh, empowered citizens and, and uh, connected citizens digitally in a way that few other countries have, have done. Tell us how that's worked. Well, thank you for this very kind introduction. Well, the most important thing uh, to share is that uh, in Estonia, uh, all the uh, public services can happen and mostly do happen without the citizen going to any public office. So we offer the public services remotely across the internet. Uh, just, you know, if you want to register your address or if you want to check if anybody is uh, eligible to sign on behalf of uh, that, this is all in electronic registers and everybody can check without uh, passing any physical paper documents or, or visiting any public office. Now, uh, in order to have that possible, uh, we introduced the digital ID already 18 years ago. Uh, this is like uh, uh, electronic uh, version of your passport that works as uh, one physical part, be it your SIM card uh, that has this additional functionality and, and one uh, um, so to say digital part, which is uh, usually a PIN code, and, and this together creates a very safe authentication uh, uh, solution. So long story short, uh, with or without COVID, Estonians get all their public services uh, from their homes or, or from their uh, offices. They don't go to any public offices. Um, much because we are small, but this is mainly because uh, we started uh, or, or rather restarted our uh, government uh, and our uh, 
system, if we can call it this way, uh, around 30 years ago when we uh, got our freedom back from the occupation of, of Soviet Union. And, and uh, when starting something from scratch 30 years ago, it was exactly the right time to start uh, from the beginning digitally, not uh, not going uh, there with this uh, red tape and, and lots of uh, paper bureaucracy. So that's the, that's the and, and story fact, I mean, in a nutshell. Uh, probably quite a few questions follow from that, but what sort of issues have you faced in doing that? I mean, one immediate uh, question, we'll come on to the advantages of it in a second, but one immediate question is the security of this. Uh, have you, and Estonia has been the, the victim of some quite sophisticated uh, hacking or cyber attacks in, in, in the, over the, the period that you mentioned. Have there been issues of security? Are citizens confident that this can all happen in a secure way? Absolutely. It's actually much more secure than keeping any valuable data on paper. Uh, you know, in private sector, this is done digitally uh, for quite long already. If you think about, let's say, a uh, very sensitive uh, topic like banking. Uh, there is no probably in UK or, or anywhere else in, in big countries that keeps uh, uh, the logs, how much money everybody has on paper. This is all uh, in digital system and uh, we trust our money uh, to be in uh, registered, uh, the amount we have, the transactions we have had, all is digital. If this fails, there is no paper proving that I had uh, 100,000 uh, uh, pounds in this or that uh, uh, British. The same way, Estonian government has introduced uh, different, uh, and, and uh, not in, in one location, but in different locations, in different uh, um, systems, uh, the, the like similar information basis, basically like like the banks have. So so yeah, I would say it's much more uh, safe uh, than having uh, uh, documents on paper, and also it's uh, much more secure because uh, uh, you know verifying your identity with your gas not the most secure way to do it in 21st century, and uh, and signing something uh, with just a scribble. Uh, I think it's ridiculously unsafe. Uh, in Estonia, we sign documents uh, with digital stamp that has a highest level encryption. So if you think which is easier to falsify, scribble, that reminds your name or might not remind your name, uh, or uh, the latest encryption, on it. I think uh, there is nobody that says that the scribble is more safe. And so just to uh, come on to, to Jacqueline in a moment, but I want to ask you also what, what challenges have you had and what exper over the experience of these past 18 or so years, uh, what, what lessons from the issues that you've had to overcome in implementing this uh, would you draw out and say that to other governments who may be considering such a system, they should bear in mind? Mm -hmm. Uh, the biggest questions have been around uh, security and privacy. So the system has to be designed this way that uh, uh, the citizen uh, knows what happens with the data. Otherwise, the citizens uh, are suspicious. Uh, it, actually, the Estonian government doesn't have any more information than any other government in the world about uh, their citizens. But as it is digital, it it's always people thinking that, you know, we don't know what to do with that. Now, in order to prevent that, most of the critical systems in Estonia have uh, proper logs. So, for example, my health data is fully digital. It's in a central system. So any doctor can have a look at my health data if I haven't closed it uh, specifically. I need to close some parts of my health data in order to uh, not them to ha see that. But if they see it without my permission, I can press. So, uh, in a way, if my even if my dentist is looking at my knee injury information, uh, uh, that's a violation. And there is a log that I, as a patient, see myself. I can just log in right now with my iPhone and see who has looked at my health data during the last year or so. And if there is any doctor who has looked that uh, I haven't uh, authorized to do so, I can, uh, in principle, press charges. So, I think the biggest the biggest uh, concern are always security, like 
both uh, the system needs to be secure and also how, how the data privacy is, is handled because rightfully so people want to know what actually happens with their data. So, Jacqueline, if I could turn to you now, your organization, specifically uh, UK uh, Association, listening to that, um, how far along the line do you think the UK is in this and how, what lessons would you draw from a country that's had such a comprehensive system uh, as Estonia has had? Yeah, thank you very much. Really interesting listening to Tavi there. I, I would just say that there are a couple of assumptions in it, which is that we have, they have an agreed standard of establishing credentials online. We are nowhere close to that. In fact, I think as a country, we rejected it roundly, um, possibly because of the way the story landed. But um, establishing credentials online as a, as a standard for everybody is, is firstly a grounding principle. Secondly, broadband infrastructure for the entire country, hashtag not just cities is a must in order to get it done. So that's regional inclusion uh, is very important. And also the assumption that everyone has access to tech. Not everyone has access to tech in the UK. Um, I think there's 12 and a half percent of the population do not. And so, and on top of that, you know, one in seven registered disabled. So the inability to use the tech, even if they have it, um, there's lots of differences, I think, between the UK and Estonia. The one, one area where we are catching up, of course, because of the pandemic, is that adoption has been super fast over the last few months. So, you know, the countries that thrive in a digital society are the ones that adopt very quickly a digital uh, option. And so that is helping us to catch up. But we, we do have to make sure we don't leave anybody behind because of underlying assumptions that everyone has access to tech and we have an agreed standard on digital identity because we don't. And so how do you um, sort out, if you like, or address that last 10% or whatever it is of people who aren't, who aren't connected in a world which is depending more on digital energy? Because even if you don't go as far as Estonia has gone and make all services digitized in this way. Connectivity is absolutely crucial in all sorts of other areas for economic opportunity. And we see that now, that if, you're, if you can't connect um, in the way that we're doing now, for example, many jobs aren't, simply aren't going to be possible. Yeah, and, and I think the pandemic will have amplified areas where we have had to work, work harder anyway. So businesses that weren't doing well before are definitely not doing well now. If you're not digital, you're simply not in the game. So, um, for example, let me give you a great example. Amazon, Jeff Bezos, made 28 billion in June of this year, um, owns the high street. You know, there are other companies, British, you know, clothing businesses, for example, who've got no online presence, made precisely zero, um, having made you know, 9 billion last year, for example. So, if you're not digital, you're not in the game, that is certainly a change in the landscape. We have to then think about how we design our technology so that we don't leave anybody behind. And we have to also make sure that we roll out broadband, as you say, to every corner of the geographical country uh, borders. Otherwise, we will be in danger of creating for just the large cities and also solving for just the large companies. And in the UK, 66% of all jobs come from SMEs, and we have to be careful about that. And, and where do you think the responsibility for that lies principally? Is it mainly government or is it private sector as well? Uh, I think the best outcomes come where industry and government work together. And so I would like to see that public-private partnership work harder and faster with a more um, precise imperative, creating broadband as a utility. For an, as an example, and making sure that we have that access for everybody, but also that, you know, whilst we do that, we make sure that we've got the education in place for those that aren't yet digital savvy to make sure that they can take um, advantage of the new digital future. Yeah. Andrew, if I could bring you in now, you, you, your company obviously involved in, in, in setting this sort of, or helping this, this infrastructure. Uh, take place, but it's a very mixed picture around the world, also a very contested picture around the world uh, these days. Um, if, you, if you sort of take a quick tour of the world, how would you see that 
picture now? Is it is it very patchy? Oh, without doubt. Um, you know, we've we've conducted uh, research. Um, ITU has done likewise, and there seems to be there's a very strong correlation. It seems with uh, latest economic forecasts in terms of the strength of those going into 2021 and the level of um, sophistication of connectivity and digital ecosystems of countries. And I think on, on Jacqueline's point, if you, if you look around the world, um, actually what we've seen is that the, the flexibility and agility of digital solutions has really been uh, critical during this pandemic. And I think it's been noted by you know, the likes of, of Microsoft, other big tech companies, that they've taken their customers through, uh, you know, two, three months of digital transformation that they would have expected previously to take about five years. So there's been, you know, a, a real acceleration, I think, in terms of digitalization of companies. And of course, the, the, the foundation of that is, is digital uh, infrastructure. So it seems even more crucial than ever uh, that we build out uh, across all countries as much as we can, um, uh, much better digital infrastructure. I think Bill Gates remarked actually uh, in an interview uh, with The Economist, he talked about how remarkable it was that we had essentially built digital infrastructure that allowed us to go and watch Netflix at home uh, when we got home from work. And that kind of five megabits per second had provided the foundation for us to actually work from home uh, during the lockdowns uh, and the need for social distancing. It allowed us to, to buy goods and services online and get them delivered, and also the continuation of our, our children's education. So really, you know, I think, uh, if anything, that the crisis has shown the real critical need uh, for build-out and acceleration of digital infrastructure. So where are the, the gaps? I mean, Jacqueline talked about you know, this in the UK context, obviously, but the you know, 12 percent or, 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 or so of people who are not connected. If you if you look at the uh, not just the, those who are not con connected, but the, 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 those who need faster connections, the, the, the huge, presumably huge growth in demand that lies ahead as we depend more and more on digital services. What do you see as the crunch points coming up? The crunch points really in the advanced economies is this, you know, con continuous issue about, you know, rural um, uh, connectivity. Okay, so where the kind of the private costs of setting uh, up infrastructure um, is, is seen as too much by the, the by the private sector. So, um, but there's ample evidence to suggest that the social benefits of doing so uh, far outweigh those those private costs. So those are ongoing issues. We know that. Um, we, we really recognize the need for um, a build out of, of high mega, uh, megabits um, uh, download capability. We're talking about gigabit capability now across a lot of Europe. Um, so the cost of you know, fiber to the home, fiber to the premises is still very prohibitive in, in, in some countries. Uh, 5G is clearly you know, the, uh, the, the backup uh, or rival solution to that. So uh, that's the ongoing issues about kind of, you know, closing the digital divide, but there's a much more pressing need, obviously, in the developing world in terms of how they, uh, you know, advance and, and make sure they don't fall even further behind in terms of, you know, the, the obvious growth opportunities in the digital economy going forward. So there's a number of you know, solutions that the industry is looking at to, um, um, to, to, to assist with, with those kind of issues and challenges. Well, let's look at some of these sort of uh, divides that need to be, to be addressed to, to unlock value, I suppose, for, for everyone, not just those who already have the, the ability to, to, to be connected. Tavi, how have you uh, tackled this? Because, I, you know, I did refer to Estonia as a small country, but it's not a completely uniform country, and it, it will have its pockets of less connected, and it's you presumably had to deal uh, with precisely the sorts of issues that, that uh, uh, Jacqueline's been talking about of those who are not connected. What, do you have solutions that you, uh, from your experience that you can share? Well, first of all, uh, there are, of course, uh, also in Estonia, people who don't use computers, and, and there needs to be at, at least uh, right still so far uh, uh, some sort of solution for them, either with the uh, with with having the backup of uh, of uh, getting the service also 
also uh, waiting uh, the municipality or, or public office. But uh, but the amount of those people who don't have any digital uh, access is actually uh, decreasing very rapidly. Uh, and this is not so much be uh, because governments, but it is uh, preci precisely about the topic that uh, Angie was uh, was uh, mentioning, co connectivity in terms of. Uh, uh, so far, it's mostly uh, 4G still, but but uh, in soon uh, 5G and and, uh, and uh, also uh, uh, fiber. Uh, but also, it is thanks to using uh, smartphones. Uh, many people in the world, uh, including my grandfather, by the way, who's 84, has never owned a PC. He has never known how to operate the PC, uh, whereas he has had. Um, all the latest and uh, uh, greatest uh, 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 phones, uh, and he can use it very easily because it's so much more intuitive for for him. And also, if I look at my kids, you know, my youngest is not even one and a half years old, and she is also already like using the basic things that uh, she needs to use uh, on her I iPad. So, so I think uh, thanks to technology developing, thanks to connectivity uh, getting better and better, uh, the digital divide uh, uh, will uh, uh, get, get smaller and smaller. And, and uh, I'm very much with Jacqueline that, of course, we need to uh, address that as well. But uh, so, like, if we have even even one person who cannot access any computer, then we need to have some sort of physical backup. But the same is with banks. I mean, most of the people uh, are using uh, internet banking for quite some time already, but there are still some bank, uh, bank offices. Simply, there are less bank offices, and they don't need to be as big because nobody really goes there. At least, at least in Estonia, like the bank, the number of bank offices is much more and the cost also uh, to maintain them so they can invest uh, in, in uh, other aspects. And the same applies basically to public offices. So we can, the money that we can save from uh, having public offices open uh, as like physical office to, to visit as a citizen, we can invest this to development and do something greater. So you paint a rather encouraging picture of a sort of diminishing set of problems because of more people connected, more intuitive technology. Can I put it to you, perhaps, Jacqueline, you, you could have a go at this, that there is another set of problems or issues that may be growing uh, as we, as we digi digitize more and more, and that's because of the role of the algorithm. And what goes on in the background is, in many, in, in many cases, a sort of mystery to, uh, to the user, but, but we're being directed to things through algorithms, and those algorithms um, sort of have a mind of their own and are sometimes, uh, well, they're certainly only as good as the data that you feed into them. And sometimes that, that the data that you feed in is itself based on a rather um, biased, if you like, a view of, of the world or, or partial um, uh, uh, cross-section of, of society. So you may be um, building in um, a, a sort of tilted view of uh, who gets the opportunities through the algorithms that um, that, that digital technology depends on. So uh, I suppose the question to you is, is that a problem? And if it is, what do you do about it? It certainly is a problem. I, you know, even without technology, we live in a world of privilege and bias, which we, we need to be able to see past if we're going to digitize it. So, you know, when the seatbelt was invented, women and children died simply because the seatbelt was invented by men of a certain weight and height. So, you know, you start from there and you go to police stab vests in the UK are still built for humans without breasts. And, and we could go on. And the moment you start to digitize all of those things is the moment you get to the state that you're talking about, Daniel, which is, you know, if an algorithm now decides whether you get that job interview, that loan, um, access to um, a place at university, then we have to make sure that these algorithms are built by diverse teams that reflect all of our voices and all of our community. Because otherwise, there is no other way to police that. If you start putting governance in, the governance itself could be biased or skewed or from a certain socioeconomic position. So diverse voices, you know, I think, AI guru Dame Wendy Hall said, if it's not diverse, it's simply not ethical in relation to building algorithms. So I think that's, that's one part of it. 
I think the other part of it is that, um, you know, transparency is super important. So algorithms should not be built as a black box. And we need to be able to see how algorithms are built so that we can understand the instructions that humans have given them uh, when they've been built. And then to your final point about data, you know, data and clean data lakes are super important as a currency of the future, because it is those data lakes that will define and decide how algorithms and machine learning starts to educate itself. And that's where you get exponential um, uh, changes in outcomes that you probably would class today as um, massive unintended consequences. And we already see it on trading floors of the stock market where we have to stop a rogue algorithm going off and doing some bad trades. So yeah, it, it, we have to worry about all of that. But I think diversity is the answer to most of those questions. So, so I, I would expect a, a sort of a industry group like like yours or, or an association like yours to be out in front of that, to be very aware of it, to be to be pushing for it. But you, as far as you can tell, do you think the public is getting more engaged in this? Do you, th do you think there's a, a bigger, broader pressure pushing in this direction? I, th I think there is because we're interfacing with more um, pieces of software. You know, when when we talk to um, customer service centers these days, you think you're talking to a human, you're actually talking to a chatbot. And, you know, you can, you can tell after a few questions that you're not actually being answered by a human. And actually, good, they are know. pretty good. They are very, very good. That, you know, and that's, that's, that's great, um, RPA, robotics and process automation. But we also then need to make sure that there is insight into the answers that they that they are giving. So I'll, I'll give you a great example. Last night, I got a response from travel insurance saying, this is the outcome from your travel claim. And I went back and said, well, hold on a minute. I don't understand how you have calculated this. A human would have probably given me that conversational piece, but I wasn't given that. And I think it's a great example of the public will now start to demand insight because the computer says no, is no longer going to be good enough, uh, especially for those companies wanting to create competitive advantage whilst they're using and leveraging automation. And Andrew, is this something that you, from the from the tech company point of view, that you're um, mindful of, experiencing pressure for? How does it seem to you? Yes. Well, uh, I'm a bit more optimistic about these things. I think there's a there's. Um, there is a great recognition of, uh, around these issues. Um, I think actually the EU is really kind of at the forefront of solutions. So we think of you know um, policies that are already being put in place, such as the GDPR. But the EU released its white paper on artificial intelligence back in February. Uh, it had this kind of checklist for all companies, essentially, but especially technology companies um, to go through. Uh, see how they score, where the obvious uh, gaps are uh, in terms of what they're doing. And, uh, you know, the, uh, Huawei has done uh, and been actively involved in this process uh, in Europe. So, you know, we've really taken a, a very rigorous uh, look, at, uh, look at this. Um, uh, even to date, there's only, a, you know, not all technology companies have really come out and talked about their principles for artificial intelligence. Uh, but we are, you know, very close to uh, to publishing that. Um, and, you know, the, it's, we are, again, this is all very new technology. It's all nascent and it's, you know, it's, 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 it's difficult to think through, you know, how this will really impact on, on our economies and our societies over the next five, ten years. But, it, you know, it will be impactful. So it's kind of grouping around certain uh, thematic categories, pillars, uh, we're trying to put rules in place about human AI collaboration. Uh, there's always kind of a, you know, uh, um, uh, oversight by humans. Humans should always supersede these decisions. Um, issues surrounding safety and robustness, uh, security and privacy, of course, uh, traceability and accountability, uh, diversity, non-discrimination, and fairness. But there's a lot to do. I know of a kind of a 
uh, anecdotal story. It wasn't in our company, but uh, I think it's a really uh, interesting one about AI. So um, it's being used a lot, uh, many of us know, in terms of recruitment in HR. And it was being used in a technology company, who I won't name, but it's not Huawei. Uh, and effectively, it was obviously uh, having a bias towards male applicants. So they scrubbed the data, they anonymized it in terms of gender. Um, but then it was picking up the machine learning uh, kind of, you know, hobbies like computer gaming or, uh, you know, uh, um, American football, things that perhaps, you know, were more popular with men. So the machine learning was learning to kind of uh, be biased by other data sets. And these things are often very hard to pick up. Uh, a priori. So I think we're all going on this journey, but I think, you know, the industry, many other stakeholders recognize the problems and issues. Jack, and you're, you're nodding at that. I mean, it's a, it's a sort of uh, uh, quite a hard thing to tackle, isn't it? Because it's so built in, to, as you say, it's, it's, it's hard programming in or hard wiring in, softwaring in, perhaps, I don't know what the expression would be, uh, pre-existing prejudices. And that's the danger. You reinforce um, what's already there rather than trying to do something about it. Yeah, and, and we have to just challenge ourselves always. And, and maybe it's not just a single check, it's a double check, it's a triple check on, on just what lens are you looking at this through? How do we make sure that the software learns to check itself, actually, as well? Um, and, and, and I am totally optimistic that we will have a thriving digital ethics community. And, and you know, and I look at the bodies in, in the UK as well as, as the ones that uh, Andrew mentioned, but we've got the Government Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation. We've got the Nuffield Foundation, um, the Ada Lovelace Institute. All of these people, you know, they wake up every morning and worry about all of these things. And, and we as an industry have to make sure that we are at the vanguard of that, making sure that the things that we are building are built by diverse teams so that we create a future that includes everybody and doesn't isolate um, the few on the fringes. What, what I'd like to do now is turn to really the experience of this year. Um, first of all, some of the lessons uh, that, that have been learned through this very intense kind of case study that we've been all been going through. Um, and then perhaps look at some of the turning ahead to um, the, the, the sort of brighter opportunities that, that uh, rapid more rapid adoption of digital technologies represent, and then perhaps also um, looking at some of the dark side of this and the, the things that we have to be aware of or be wary of uh, in that process. So let, let's look at the lessons first of all. I'd like to ask, go around this virtual table and ask you all uh, for one or two of the main lessons that you've drawn and also that, that perhaps policymakers and corporate leaders ought to be mindful of um, through through this uh, extraordinary period we've been in. So, Tavi, let's let's start with you. What what, what do you think um, springs out from a year of extraordinary reliance and acceleration of d the digital world? Well, uh, as an optimist, uh, let me just pick some uh, very positive uh, trends. Uh, uh, for example. Could be not uh, meet uh, at a conference uh, with you, um, and it, in a way, of course, I would prefer uh, uh, doing that. But uh, on the other side, uh, uh, having this um, uh, technology uh, of video conferencing going so viral as it has gone, it, it has actually uh, made the world a smaller place in a way, so that uh, you know we can uh, talk to. Uh, uh, China to uh, to UK to Estonia, uh, while everybody is actually uh, at their own offices, and, and we can do this call right now. And in one hour, we we can talk to uh, three other countries. So so doing business, uh, uh, interacting with friends, uh, th this this has bec become uh, in a way also much easier. Uh, if I need to pick only one sector where I think uh, this uh, COVID. Uh, um, made us innovate and made us think differently is uh, education. Uh, my daughter, who goes to uh, fifth grade, uh, uh, 
uh, had to stay uh, at um, at home to to study from home. They had all sorts of digital tools to do that. Uh, Estonia wasn't completely ready for that because we hadn't practiced that uh, before to to this extent, and uh, now. Uh, it is like a new normality that, that can function very well. And this gives me a chance to take separate courses from, let's say, Oxford or MIT. Or, by the way, I took during this pandemic, I took a course at uh, artificial intelligence, the topic that we, you were talking so interestingly about. Uh, uh, and this, again, like it gives me, uh, who I am far from London, an opportunity to study at UK universities. I think it's a, it's a good thing. Great. Uh, Andrew, uh, from, from far as you're concerned, I mean, oh, clearly the, the, this period has coincided with your company being thrust into the geopolitical spotlight. You're right in the, in the heart and the heat of, of great power uh, rivalry. W what lessons do you draw from, from this past year? Well, the lessons, I mean, I think I touched upon it earlier. Uh, we've, we've witnessed the data really shows that there's been this, these trends were, were, were ongoing in terms of digital adoption and digitalization. Um, they've been greatly accelerated in 2020 across many businesses. That's not to say that all internet companies have done well. Clearly those uh, companies like Airbnb or Uber have, uh, have suffered um, much more than others. Uh, but by and large, there has been this great acceleration. I think UK is a really good case in point. It was a world leader in terms of e-retail as a proportion of overall retail sales. I think it was something like 20%. Um, it's been measured, you know, kind of through spring and into summer that it's let unbelievably up to around 35%. So, you know, obviously we... Once the pandemic is over, we'll go back to some sort of normality and, and some recognition of how things were before. But a lot of people are calling it the new normal. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of these changes are here to stay. And I would also say it's been, um, you know, it's, it's a bit counterintuitive, uh, but uh, there has been great business creation and a lot of innovation uh, stunningly in China about new ways of doing things. There's a company called We Doctor, for example, that's, uh, that's part of, um, a, 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 a Tencent. Um, and they offered free medical consultations online and they have uh, increased their subscriber base 36 times, explosive growth. People couldn't visit properties in China, obviously during the lockdown and, and afterwards. Uh, with social distancing. So you've had this real takeoff through uh, real estate agents or virtual reality. You can visit properties uh, and do it that way. And again, these types of companies that have adopted to digitalization have done extremely uh, well. So, you know, I think there's other examples that are coming through. Etihad is now really trialing kind of health, digital health checks distancing at airports, partnering with technology companies. Um, so that's, that's been a real lesson of this year, is this, this uh, acceleration in, in trends in digitalization and this great in, leap in innovation. Yeah, you're in Shenzhen and, and uh, you know, life in, in China has, has gone back more to, to normal than in many uh, other parts of the world. So how, I think how much of these changes are, are sticking um, when people are not, no longer worrying so much about a uh, pandemic? That's going to be a critical question right around the world. Or is it, how much of this is one-off adjustment and how much is here to stay, do you think, from what you have it's observed? It, yeah, it feels like a lot of this is, is, is uh, here to stay, okay? It's really quite remarkable, the kind of, especially on the e, e retail. I mean, they, China is al al already very advanced. We know that from the likes of Alibaba. Um, but I think, you know, a real difference has been the way that during the pandemic and the aftermath, you know, there really wasn't that much travel that was happening. Uh, so lots of rural areas that depended on tourists to come and buy kind of local produce. They suffered. So, you know, and, and in Hubei province, there was a reluctance to buy anything from, uh, from, from that province and, and from Wuhan. So actually, you know, the big retailers and the internet companies rallied round and they held these kind of big festivals online to showcase, you know, uh, uh, delicious peaches from Hubei province. And, uh, you know, as a nation, people rallied round and started ordering 
you know, these types of, of, of local goods and produce. And that's, that's, that's being maintained, you know. So I think, you know, a lot of things that have happened out of necessity um, look set to change. And, and just to go back, you know, on, on what Tavi was uh, also um, talking about with the, with, the, with the older generation, the older generation, I think as well, there's lots of evidence to suggest an unintended consequence of the pandemic has actually been the adoption of digital uh, solutions and tools for the first time people had to use these tools you know they had to start video streaming with their grandchildren or their children uh, you know they had to start buying online so we've seen you know uh, surveys and, and evidence to suggest that the uh, you know the silver surfers as they're called have uh, you know really greatly expanded so uh, you know a good unintended consequence has been the kind of improvement in digital awareness and digital skills of a demographic a group of people that had been previously quite hard to reach Jacqueline, if you could pick up your your lessons from this year and also lessons for government, for policymakers, because it hasn't clearly, we've seen in the UK, on the tech front, it hasn't all been plain sailing, has it? No, it hasn't. But I, I enjoyed listening to both Tavi and Andrew. I certainly think education, the reach of education has just been phenomenal. We've all had a bit more time. And so, you know, we've been able to go anywhere. So I totally, I totally get that. I've also... I see shifts that will stay. I certainly cannot see myself going to a doctor's surgery for something I can have a five minute consultation on uh, via, via video call, which you know will certainly change because flexible working has meant that we drive less and we drive more for efficiency. And I think that's definitely something that will happen. As I sit on my various boards and Rightmove is one of them, property uh, portal, and uh, it's it's so interesting where, you know, as a board member, lots of conversation around, we ought to do this for digital transformation. We ought to make this investment. Now, digital transformation is right up there, number one, number two, and number three, in terms of what do we need to do? And, and I think the, the investments are much more um, focused and urgent, which was not the case before. Um, I would say, uh, to answer the question around government, there are some things that um, we are pushing for with the UK government, and that is that it's always easier, and Tavi will probably um, recognise this, it's always easier to solve for the larger companies and not the smaller ones. And so one of the things that we're pushing for is, it sounds quite, quite mundane actually, but it's tax credits for OPEX, not just CAPEX, when it comes to technology um, spend. And that means that our smaller and medium businesses can spend their um, tax efficient money on cloud services and not have to become technologists themselves. Uh, you know, we still have 25% of businesses in the UK who do not have a website. So we have to be very mindful of the fact that we've got to encourage much more digital adoption. That may have changed um, since March, by the way, but it is very interesting how we must continue to push government on policy like this to encourage smaller businesses. And as I said before, 66% of all jobs in this country come from small businesses. We are a nation of corner shops and we do have to make sure we look after that sector. There's a, perhaps this links into the, there's a question from the audience on the UK tech sector has sustained a series of uh, punches uh, on privacy, COVID, uh, Huawei 5G replacement. Um, these are self-inflicted wounds. Uh, this person says, how can we overcome them and avoid others? So I suppose, how can we get better at this policy making business on tech in, 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 in UK? Well, I think the first thing is we need to have more tech people in government. Uh, because from that perspective, you'll have more people who understand the problem. And I think that that's half the battle. I, I think the other thing is to is to start to remove some barriers like, uh, you know, we're talking about broadband and rolling that out. Um, but we don't make it easy, even from a planning perspective, how do you get, you know, a new mast installed? We have lots of barriers in the way where we need to make that kind of um, infrastructure and construction build easier. We need to in incentivize uh, that new take up of gigabit broadband, educate people that they can trust it. 
uh, and and you know I think work to close the digital divide that has been opening up between rural uh, communities and um, with cities. Thank you. Now I said I, w I wanted to look at both the, the the bright side and the dark side of, of uh, in the future. The, let, let's start with the bright side and and perhaps the green side. Actually, there's a lot of talk about how digital technologies can really play a, a, a substantial role in reducing carbon emissions, moving towards an economy that is uh, much less uh, polluting and much less um, intensive in, in, in the sorts of uh, harmful substances that, that uh, contribute to global warming. Um, how, how to make that opportunity really happen? And Tavi, perhaps you could talk about um, your country and, and how you think that might be part of the the economic policy framework in the coming years to, to push things in that direction if it doesn't happen organically? Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, in order to push uh, uh, changes forward, uh, there, there is a need for political leadership, uh, obviously. Uh, and, and I think it's, um, it's very positive that uh, there is a serious uh, political commitment, I would say, almost globally, or I think it's correct to say globally, uh, in, uh, in uh, tackling uh, or addressing climate change and, and, uh, and uh, making the economy and, and, and the world uh, uh, less consuming, let's put it this way, in terms of, uh, or, or less uh, polluting. Um, I think uh, also, uh, a lot of those things that take things digital uh, actually address the same uh, concerns and they are uh, um, helping us uh, to to make make world a better place also uh, uh, climate wise uh, be it um, simple things as, as having uh, less things on, on paper or, or, or be it more serious things like uh, um, autonomous vehicles uh, driving on, on hydrogen or, or electricity. I mean, there is a number of things that can, uh, can address that. Andrew, from your perspective, is this something that you're uh, pushing uh, for, for uh, governments to, 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 to help adopt um, with, with the help of digital infrastructure? Oh, for sure. I mean, on on, uh, on on in many different dimensions. You know, we think we, we're great advocates for this idea of a digitally driven and green economic recovery. They really go hand in hand. There's many examples of that. You know, uh, for ex for example, in the developing world, when we're thinking about building out smart grids, digital technologies are really uh, absolutely vital in terms of you know managing uh, different power supplies. We provide in partnership with many other uh, companies kind of solutions to that. It's, it's quite extraordinary how digital um, capabilities for, for measurement uh, can be really insightful in terms of managing your electricity grid. Build out of, 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 of national power grids as well are going hand in hand with fibre rollout. So as the developing world is kind of building out their smart, hopefully green grids, you run through the cabling, the fibre that you need for that. We have a solution we're very proud of called Rural Star. Um, and this is our attempt to bridge the real digital divide that still exists. Something like 700 million people around the world still have no connectivity, even to 2G, can't use mobile phones. So Rural Star doesn't look very pretty, but it's, uh, it's a base station and antennae system. Uh, it runs off of solar power. You know, previously, these things used very dirty uh, diesel generators, so it's completely solar powered. And it's really profound, it's the, the, the impacts uh, that that these kind of um, you know these these rollout of of rural uh, mobile infrastructure connectivity has on these villages that previously had no connectivity at, at all. So it's not just in terms of you know environmental impacts. They can have uh, information from governments to help them uh, in terms of lowering their environmental impact. But it has really profound impacts. We've done a case study with GSMA that talks about a village in Kenya called Dusa. Um, and it just talks about how security was improved, security flows into healthcare because doctors, nurses are more willing to go and uh, stay in these villages. The healthcare improves, children start going to school more often. You know, it just has this virtuous uplift 
uh, and, and cycles. So, you know, maybe uh, one of the opportunities of, of this year and this pandemic is for governments and many stakeholders to really think about, you know, how we digitalize and green our existing and future infrastructure. And, and Tracton, isn't there a little bit of a danger that this becomes the mantra for everybody and it, 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 it sounds almost, um, you know, the, the too, too good to be true in many, in many ways, but do you think it's, re it's really as, as much of an opportunity as is made out? I think so. I mean, I think if only from a conscience perspective, you know, we're the first generation to know we're destroying the planet and the last one that can do anything about it. So you know, there is that conscience piece. But I think the other part of that is that I think companies will start to be measured on their contribution to society as much as their contribution to profit in the stock market. Because, you know, the pandemic has done a lot of things, but it's also created something else, which is much more of a community spirit, a local um, conscience support mechanism. The lowest paid workers in our society um, have now become the most important um, key workers, you know, cleaners and nurses. And hopefully we will start to behave differently around how communities matter, how companies are judged. And I think companies will now be also judged on their social value and how they perform in terms of climate uh, as much as they are on their, you know, all of their other socioeconomic contributions. And I think that's really, really important to remember. It will also be, I think, the next generation will think about who they want to work for based on the purpose and generosity of uh, a company's vision and mission. So I, I personally think that will be very important as we go forward. And digital has a big part to play in that because we're also seeing that flexible working, for example, has enabled us to work from anywhere. Efficiency is the altar at which we all you know, worship at. And now we need to make sure that we harness that efficiency and we also pay it back through doing the right thing for our climate and our local community as well. Well, we've just got a few minutes left, and I, 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 I apologise for focusing on the dark side in these last few minutes, but I think we have to go there uh, because there are worries about, I mean, we haven't skirted worries about uh, the, the making sure everybody is engaged and has the opportunities, but there are also worries about uh, privacy, there are worries about misuse of, of data, uh, worries about artificial intelligence going off with almost a mind of its own, um, worries about state snooping, and uh, Andrew, how worried should we be about that? And people are very worried about China, for example, and your company is a Chinese company, and people worry about its connections to the Chinese state. For sure, you know, as I mentioned previously, there, there is an opportunity here, but, you know, as with all kind of technologies of the past, the technology itself is benign, it's the humans, they're essentially the problem and how they're used. But this is not a time for um, uh, for, for division, it's a, this is really a time for cooperation. There are, um, as I mentioned, there are many initiatives that are out there to try and allay these concerns. There's, there was the Paris call from President Macron um, talking about the need for, for the governments of the world to come together and really kind of lay down the, 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 the rules, the framework for cyber security uh, and national cyber security at that. And there has been some uptake, um, but there's lots more that can be done. Um, I mentioned, you know, there are there are the the efforts within uh, the European Union to set a global standard, as it's done with GDPR, on data and data privacy in terms of you know setting down the the, the ground rules for artificial intelligence uh, uh, as well. Um, so you know the the other aspect of this, of course, as well, is that if we're going to spend money wisely, taxpayers' money wisely as well, this is not a time to restrict markets. Um, the the, uh, the the 5G equipment market is actually, you know, there's only really five major players in the world. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, Huawei is at, really at the forefront in terms of technical capability uh, and, and quality uh, for, for money. 
uh, this is not the time to really, you know, close down competition because we know that competition, uh, uh, closed competition, restricting companies increases prices. It's going to delay rollout. This has been admitted even by, you know, UK government and others. It's going to greatly uh, um, uh, delay the rollout of 5G, a really fundamental technology, at really the worst time to be doing that. So, you know, there are, there are lots of ways that, uh, that there are lots of problems and challenges that we need to resolve. Um, but they're not going to be solved by standoffs. But, but that's where we are, isn't it? I mean, uh, the, that, that, in a way, that battle's been lost, hasn't it? We're, we're in, the, in, in, in a situation where the, the, the barriers are coming down. And what are, the, what are going to be the consequences? Uh, are we going to see a divided world, do you think, in technological terms? So, um, well, you, know, you will know, Daniel, it's very hard to forecast the future. There are many things that happen to uh, <laughs> to change. I hope not. I hope not. We'll see. We'll see next year. Um, certainly within the industry, you know, there is uh, there is no um, many relationships have been built up between Chinese companies, American companies, others over decades in terms of the tech sector. This has all been very unfortunate. There is no push to you know have this bifurcation uh, and different technology spheres of influence around the world are kind of North America, uh, Europe, uh, Asia. Nobody wants that at all. So, you know, we are looking to the politicians to, to perhaps uh, see sense, and we hope reason will prevail. Okay. And Tavi, if I could turn to you on this, I mean, you've been, I, I guess your focus naturally in Estonia when it comes to the dark side is, is, is more towards Russia, uh, and you, you have um, very tangibly felt uh, Russia's attention, I think, on the tech front. So how, how do you tackle that in future and how do you prepare for that or minimize the risks, I suppose? Well, there is no country uh, probably that hasn't uh, felt Russian attention. Uh, you know, US uh, cyber cases uh, are, are much more recent than, than the Estonian ones. But, but in, in, in the case of uh, the uh, designing the uh, uh, digital world, of course, you need to take care of cybersecurity as basic hygiene. I mean, that it goes without saying. You cannot do anything with, without that. But uh, just to like contradict just lightly, I think uh, uh, gathering data uh, on on certain issues uh, uh, while treated properly, as as I agree with Andrew, that this is very much. Uh, uh, people behind that, how we design and, and how we use that data. In many ways, it can be used uh, for our own benefit. As a politician, I see a number of ways how to uh, use data in order to do uh, or take smarter decisions. You know, we know uh, uh, from mobile uh, data, uh, anonymized, of course, how people are moving so we can plan better cities or, or, or plan it better. Or, or uh, for example, if um, elderly people in one or another city don't buy, for some reason, generic drugs, you can run a campaign or uh, on, uh, to uh, educate them and, and say that generic drugs uh, are, are equally safe. Or there are any number of, of um, cases where with uh, use of, of uh, data in an anonymized and, and systemized way, uh, you can take much better decisions and, and you can uh, serve citizens much better. Jacqueline, last word to you on this uh, dark side. How dark is it? Well, I, I'm a technology optimist. And I think the advantages of tech far outweigh the disadvantages. However, I am going to say that there is a responsibility of government and businesses to create a secure environment for us to operate in. But I am also going to say that it is our responsibility as citizens also, you know, to not be too cavalier about what we put out there as well. You know, if you're not paying for something online, then you're probably the product. And I think you just have to think about what you're putting out there. And I think there is a personal responsibility to secure your own credentials online as well, to be responsible about that. And also for you know our young people, our little people, to be able to learn how to stay safe online when they're, when they're tiny. So they need to grow up with that. We are, I think, more cavalier than we should be with data out there. I think we have a personal responsibility, 
but I think that should be working hand in hand with businesses and government as well. Well, thank you very much. We, we are out of time, but I think you've very helpfully at the end there brought in um, perhaps the final missing piece of the puzzle. We talked about uh, the roles of governments. We talked about the roles of private companies. You've just talked about the roles of individuals. Uh, I think overall we've had actually a very uh, complete broad picture of the whole complex of issues that, that have cropped up. On the whole, I take it there's an optimism out there, but I think we haven't skirted around a lot of the, the very real problems of making sure we have inclusion, making sure that we have the right protections in place, uh, and making sure that the uh, that the whole environment is such that the, the clear opportunities that we've seen accelerated under the pandemic uh, can be properly can be properly exploited. So I think this is clearly a conversation that has to continue. There's, it's so rich, it involves every aspect of our lives. But I'd like to thank you all, uh, Jacqueline, Tavi, Andrew, for, for really uh, a very uh, interesting, insightful um, uh, conversation around this set of topics. I think it's been fascinating. Thank you very much. And uh, 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 we'll, we hope to catch up again in future and see how things develop. Thank you.